Hey there, everybody. How's it going? Welcome back to another awesome episode of On the Throttle with Jackie Van Ham and my buddy Josh, bringing you all of the news out here in motorcycling and power sports. Buckle up, gang. Today's going to be another massive action-packed episode. As always, oh, thanks boy. for clicking, liking, sharing all of these videos with your friends that want to hear about all the things we got out here in motorcycling and power sports. And I already had several friends reach out and say thank you for last week's show. We featured new bikes, uh, dirt bikes, of course, from Josh. And I talked about Daytona because Daytona Bike Week is indeed underway. I had some friends reach out and say thank you for the Daytona show and that they gave them a lot of good ideas. So thank you so much we always go back through and read the comments so peek in say hey let us know where you're tuning in from or what you want to see on the show or you know fight with josh in the comments do whatever you got to do anywho for today's program as promised it is another double header episode because we've got a great interview with tim calhoun from tim calhoun power sports consulting i did an interview with him out at aim expo talking about kind of the future of power sports where we're headed dealership talk all sorts of interesting stuff for that interview so you're not going to want to miss it and i am going to be chatting about new motorcycle from indian motorcycle this time with even more chief and we're going to be talking about the results from the daytona supercross josh what you got going on in your neck of the woods so first off we are going to go north and then i don't know where the other six heavens are but we found a t7 level heaven so i'm going to talk about those two <laughs> Well, I can't wait to hear more about it, but we're all gonna have to wait for after this word from our sponsor. From the trails to the track, DID chains are manufactured with the highest quality materials and designed to give you an optimal riding experience and are the top chain choice worldwide. When performance, quality, and consistency matter, go with DID. What drives you? So as promised for today's show, we have got just all sorts of stuff going on today. We've got that great big interview. We're talking about some new bikes and some stuff going on out here in racing. So let's go ahead and dive right in. The first thing that I want to talk about was going to be the round this past week at Daytona for the folks over at Supercross. That's right. Supercross is underway there round, I think, number eight right now. It has been a very action-packed season so far. Daytona is kind of an iconic round for the folks at Supercross. It's always considered a really, really tough track, a really tough race. This definitely proved to be no different. Really, really good times going on over at Daytona. The 450 main event, we knew we were in for a treat when Eli Tomac, Cooper Webb, and Chase Sexton all started at the front of the pack in the 450 Supercross main event. Cooper Webb took control of the lead by turn two and held that spot over Tomac for the very first half of the race. Tomac and Webb battled closely and even made contact at one point. Turning point came when Webb made an uncharacteristic mistake just after the finish line, which allowed Tomac to slip by. After that, Webb stayed close, but never managed to get a pass back on Tomac. They finished just 1.7 seconds apart at the finish. Chase Sexton finished the night in third. Eli Tomac is on a bit of a roll over here, having a very, very good start of the season so far. And he is proving to be quite the man to beat over at the Daytona Supercross round, having won the Daytona Supercross several times now himself. As you can see by the by your screen, that was the crowd this past weekend at Daytona. Absolutely packed. Look at that. People all the way up in the nosebleed seats up on the third deck of the Daytona International Speedway. That race is always such a good time and is just packed and fireworks and jumps and all sorts of shenanigans. Really, really good time. Let's go ahead and dive into what was going on down at the 250 Supercross. All the players in the 250 Supercross Championship started up front at the gate drop. Um, even Hunter, or Hunter Lawrence started just outside the lead but made a few key passes in the opening lap. A run-in with Nate Thrasher put the Yamaha rider down in the sand while Lawrence continued forward. He passed for the lead just after that and run away with the rest of the main event win. That is going to be Hunter Lawrence in one, Mac Anstey, Max Anstey in two, Hayden Deegan. First time on the box for this young man. Hayden Deegan is only in his, I think, fourth race ever in Supercross and is already on the third box of the series. Unbelievable. Congratulations to Hayden Deegan, Deegan for that third place finish. Absolutely fantastic over there. Another great race going on for Supercross. That's what's going on. Josh, have you been following along with the Supercross this season? I have been some, and, and Daytona, like you said, it's an iconic race, and part of it is is because it is such a 
weird race for them because most of them, let's face it, they're indoors. This, it's not. And the dirt and everything like that is different. It's not an easy ride. You saw that trench in that jump there. That's how that stuff ends up going. So yeah, that's why it's kind of a pride. I guess I would say a crown jewel of sorts. It's not easy. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely not. And as you mentioned, this is out in nature. And by the time the main event happens, yeah. it is quite late at night. The cooling weather has come yes. in off of the ocean. It is very damp. It is very cold. That soil probably has a little bit of clay in it. it starts getting very, very slippery out there. And a surprise, surprise, there was even a little bit of rain for this <laughs> for this weekend's race at Daytona. So yeah, it was a real kind of like a not quite a mutter situation, but they definitely were wet and cold out there. So it's always just a really interesting race so anyway that's what's going on over at supercross josh what you got going on for your first story today so go north was the thing here and that involves of course the husqvarna norden 901 now last july the dealers got a sneak peek of what may have been like an upgraded version so to say and so this isn't a big surprise but it is kind of cool what husqvarna went ahead and did with this so it's still the 889 cc engine that's the same, doesn't matter, no changes. But the big difference with this is they have upgraded from the Apex suspension that comes from the factory on this to the Explore WP suspension that comes, think Adventure R 890 KTM. So really they've taken this and the, the Husqvarna uh, Norden 901 has been one of those bikes where it's kind of been... I guess I would say mild. So this is, let's call this the spicy version. So what they've done is they've <laughs> upped the front travel 20 millimeters. You end up with 240 millimeters. You have compression rebound and preloader adjustable, whereas the Apex doesn't have preload adjustable on the front end of this. Um, on the rear, you are up uh, from 43 to 48 millimeters of travel on that, or I'm sorry, on the tubes on the front. It, you went from a 43 to a 48 millimeter tube, which means of course, bigger different triple clamps. Tube diameter dictates the stiffness of any fork and that is where they're gonna do that. And you can even save a little bit of weight with that. The rear has adjustable high and low speed compression as well as rebound and preload. Those are all adjustable on that rear shock. Once again, think Adventure R890. Um, the apex suspension is rebound and preload adjustable only. So no compression. You've got two options for the compression on this. Travel is up from 215 to 240 millimeters. That's about half an inch of a jump. Now, ground clearance on the normal Norden 901 is 9.9 .9 inches. We are up to 10.6. So seat height goes, unfortunately for you, Jackie, from 34.4 .4 to 35.2. <laughs> Come on. Once again, yeah, hey, that's <laughs> that that is what it is with this. So this bike though, it is coming with heated grips. It comes with a taller windscreen. Brakes stay the same. It is up 20 pounds, but part of that is it includes a center stand. It also includes the bags that you see on the rear. So those are great things. It is available, they're saying March of 2023, which according to my watch is now. Um, it's an extra $1,300 is all, which to me is a great value. It is $15,799 is the MSRP. And if you t think about what Suzuki's done with the DRZ400 for the past 23 years, this also has bold new graphics. So to me, I think it's a great upgrade. <laughs> Like I said, the Norton 901 has been accused of being kind of mild. This, to me, makes it a much more aggressive bike. I think it's a step that Husqvarna needed to take. What are your thoughts, Jackie, besides the seat height? <laughs> well, I think the bike is a stunner. I do love the bold new graphics. I'm going to just go ahead and Same. jump on in there. I think it's a great, great, great looking bike. Um, for not much change in price, I think that's just so much more bang for the oh, buck. It's huge. Uh, it, and, you know, considering that the bike is from Sweden, I don't really expect heavy spice on, on this machine, but this indeed does turn it kind of into like a medium salsa. It's got, it's, it's a little picante for sure. Uh, but you know, $15,000 might be for you, but the cherry picker that I would have to rent in order to get on this bike adds an additional like $900 a day. So, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of the downfall there, but a uh, great bike. I have seen this quite a bit floating around the internet though. It does create a lot of buzz. So thank you yeah. so much for bringing that to our attention. 
attention. Now, as promised, today is a little bit of a show within a show within a show, action packed, double whammy, whatever you want to call it. We have got more awesome interviews coming from AIM Expo uh, going on here the next handful of weeks. So let's go ahead and dive right in because I had a really fascinating conversation with this gentleman. This is Tim Calhoun from Tim Calhoun Power Sports Consulting. We talk about the future of motorcycling and the future of motorcycling at the dealership level. Let's jump on in. Well, MPAN fam, this is Jackie Van Ham. We have had an excellent day here at AIM Expo, but I saved one of my friends for our final interview for today, day one here at AIM, Tim Calhoun, who runs your own consultancy agency out here in Power Sports, and yes. you're a member of the MIC. So I figured you were a great person to wind down day one with talking about some of the things that you've seen going on here Let's at AIM finish Expo. finish strong, Jackie. Finish strong, yes. Tim Calhoun. What is going on out here in motorcycling? Lay it on me. Um, I think there's a, a lot of question marks right now by dealers, I think, simply because we're moving back to, for lack of a better term, a more normalized economy. Okay. Um, I think there's a lot of concern that we saw, you know, 21, and 20 as spectacular years, both for growth in the number of consumers uh, who are riding or, or in the industry, as well as uh, record sales. Yep. Um, quite frankly, 22, you know, I think the industry is an average finish down about 15%. So if you're above that, kudos. Reality was, if you step back and put that in perspective, it's the third best year ever in power sports. <laughs> exactly. Right? So, exactly. I yeah. just saw the releases this past week of like a handful of OEMs that were down a little bit. And I'm like, yeah, but that's third best ever. Yeah, that right. still is in comparison to the rest of your history, and you're totally right. I mean, it, it, we all have to like look at these with a little bit of reality goggles yep. on, um, and and see where we're at. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, so. no, no. And some of the advice I've shared, especially with some of my clients, is I think, you know, if you're going to do comparisons in, in in 23, I really think you need to model it back to 2019, and that's really what you should be measuring against. You know, you can throw 20 and 21 out, in my opinion. I mean, don't get me wrong, we love it, we appreciate it, but. You can't count it if you're looking at real numbers and what is normalized. Um, we're going to have to get back to work again. Yeah, it's not going to fall in our lap necessarily as much. Um, I think really big ticket purchases are down, but based on some of the successes we've seen so far, Parts Unlimited had uh, their showcase in Kentucky two weeks ago, best showcase in their history yeah. ever. Yeah. Um, so that's a really great sign. I know talking to the OEMs on the board, um, they're all really you know spectacularly happy with their preseason sales and what's going on. So. Yep. I think we're going to have a great year, but I think we're going to have a year that you're going to have to work for it. Yeah. And, I, you know, this industry has never been afraid of work. And I think we just got a, a lot of companies are going to have to right size. Yeah. You know, and really look at that. Uh, you're going to have to pay attention to turnover rate on your products, whether it's aftermarket products or units. Um, pay attention to the flooring you have, obviously, and you know, the cash flow of the company. But if you do those business basics and pay attention, I think you have every opportunity to have another great year in this industry right now. And, uh, at least right now, it feels great. Um, you know, with the dollar even, we're seeing a lot of European brands really begin to eyeball coming back to the market, especially the aftermarket brands. Okay. That makes sense now. Um, th their brands can be competitive in this market. It's not, you know, one, two, four to the dollar. It's one to one pretty much. So that's exciting. I think you're going to see some brands return over here. Uh, we're seeing a lot of new bikes, everything from internal combustion to obviously e-bikes and e-moto. Yep. Uh, e-moto, I term, is basically a pegged e-bike versus a pedal e-bike. Um, I think for dealers, there's a little trepidation trying to figure out what they should carry. But the trend I'm seeing right now is if you've got a fat tire, go anywhere type e-bike, that's really what's turning and burning out of dealers. Yeah. Um, they're fun. They look like a motorcycle a little bit more than a mountain bike. Um, they seem to be turning over great. Uh, the, the margins for dealers, 30, 35 points, great margins on a wow. unit. Yeah. Super affordable for consumers. You're talking... You know, nineteen hundred dollars to fifty nine hundred dollars. Yeah. So not unaffordable and a great entry tool with, you know, a roll on throttle and no shifting for the most part. Yeah. So a great entry way to get people on two wheels, moving at speed, feeling the wind in their face and experiencing what it's like to be a rider yeah. at a very simple level. And then they can make a decision from there. But, you know, I think within a few miles of riding, most people have figured out if this is something they want to do for life or not. And I think exposing them to that opportunity is really what we're trying to do right now. And it's a great place to start. So yeah. it, I think e-bikes are really important, especially right now, mm -hmm. because 
every there's a little bit of like a concern about where we're headed, right? You already mentioned 20 and 21 are kind of like throw out years. I would push back and say, no, they're not. I would say those years are super important because we brought so many people in. Now I think the job is to keep them in yep. by doing community building and a handful of other things that I know you and I have talked off camera yep. about. But I think that the way that if you say business is slowing down a little bit, potentially in combustion in dealerships, well, then you need to bring a new product that gets new people in the door and the the entry the bar to entry is so much lower for yes. e-bikes that why wouldn't you double down yeah. and really buy into that product and i think it becomes a perfect tool like we said to get somebody in but extend that that ridership time move them into you know combustible or a larger e-bike as it goes yeah um i think it's a perfect point of entry and i think uh, we've got some work to do in the industry side really make sure good, safe products are out there and intelligent builds are being done. Uh, I think there's some vetting to be done in that space without question, but yeah. you were absolutely on point with the fact that a lot of what we talked about this morning was retention. We've got the biggest audience we've ever had. That overhang is only gonna last two or three years. Yeah. We gotta keep them engaged. We gotta let them know why they came into this. It's still fun and great. We gotta get them in the community and involved. I think we need dealers to not only think about that next customer through the door, but how to improve services, improve things for that current customer. Yeah. And we did a lot of talking about uh, how to improve it in the aftermarket yesterday. And we talked about some best practices. Um, KISS, keep it simple, right? Yeah. Um, looking at your service center and saying, what are the things we can do same day? Can we do oil changes? Can we do tire changes? Can we do the things we need to do to keep that person on the road riding this weekend? And maybe if they need more work, then yeah, maybe that's a three week out scheduling. But let's start looking at how we can take care of a customer right now that has needs and not make it so difficult to continue to ride, right? Yeah. Uh, we need to look at what their unit and remind them, okay, you've got X amount of hours, we need to do this, or you should add this, or you need to move into this. So it's that continuing that conversation with your current customers and making them feel part of your dealership. I mean, I don't know many people who are in as a consumer in Power Shorts who don't look at a dealership and think it's pretty cool, Yeah. right? And it's a place they wanna be and it's a place they feel connected yeah. and it's a special part of their life. So work hard to be cool. Yeah. Work hard to make them want to come back in the door. Yeah. You know, do some marketing not to sell. Do some marketing just to market and say thanks. Yeah. Come on down. We're having an event, right? Yes. Yeah. Use online. Use social. Use things. You know, create your own group on Facebook yeah. around your dealership. People who've bought from you so you can communicate directly with that consumer yeah. in a very personal fashion. Yeah. It's the fastest growing area of Facebook are these little clicky little, you know, Facebook yeah. groups. So yeah. there's opportunity. It will take a little more work, a little more effort. But man, the reward, yeah. you know, customers for five, 10, 20 years yeah. and their kids if you do it right. Yeah, I think it is such an interesting time in motorcycles and power sports and e-bikes, the whole community, the whole kit and caboodle. I think it's such a fascinating time. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us because I know you have your ear to the ground and talk to all sorts of different brands and products out here, as well as being part of the educational element going on here with the MIC and here at AIM Expo and the dealers. So I really appreciate you bringing up a couple of these topics to us. Tim Calhoun, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you for the platform, appreciate it. Yep. So yeah, great talk with Tim Calhoun, right, Josh? Mm -hmm. Super fascinating. Yeah. We could have we could have easily gone on for another thirty minutes, but I had to remember Ooh, like, okay, slow slow down, slow down. We have to cut this and put this in the show. So anyway, it was a great chat with Tim Calhoun. Who knows? We might have him back on at a later date as a guest because he just has such a great perspective out here. But anyway, so let's jump back into this week's topics. However, and thanks again to Tim for jumping on and being part of our interview series from AIM. Um, I wanted to talk about for my second story today, a new Indian that has been floating around on the internet the past week or so. It caught my eye. I think it's really, really beautiful. Josh is going to absolutely hate it. I can't wait to hear what he's got to say about it. Uh, this is the new Indian Sport Chief, which I was like, I heard the name and I was like, Sport Chief? I'm not sure where the sport part of this is, but it is a rad looking bike. It's got great kind of like FXR vibes. I'm into it. Let's chat about some of the details going on with this bike. The 2023 Indian Sport Chief comes set up from the factory with upgrades to the suspension and the brakes. Suspension on the new Sport Chief 
has a KYB inverted fork up front, while Fox shocks at the rear increased travel to four inches, which results in added cornering clearance. The leaning angle is now 29.5 degrees compared to other Indian Chief models. The quarter fared Sports Chief has Brembo brakes, radially, radial mounted four piston calipers with 350 millimeter semi floating discs up front and 300 millimeter floating rotor and a two piston caliper on the rear. Black cast wheels are wrapped in Pirelli Night Dragon tires, and the moto inspired handlebars are on six inch risers. They're an optional 10 inch riser available in the Indian accessory catalog. The blacked out Thunderstroke 116 motor delivers a claimed 120 foot pound of torque. Like other Chiefs, the Sport Chief has a four inch touchscreen powered by Indian's Bluetooth capable ride command. Three selectable ride modes, sport, standard, and tour can be accessed, as well as the cruise control to come standard and turn-by-turn -turn navigation as well. Pricing for the Chief is listed at $18,999 for Black Smoke, $19,499 for the Ruby Smoke or Stealth Gray, $19,999 for Spirit Blue Spoke. spoke. Blue, spirit blue smoke it's kind of a mouthful right there anywho yeah. so i thought this was a great looking bike and here's why i wanted to bring this up uh first of all it's the same week that harley davidson just announced their great big huge uh bolton screaming eagle kit so it's kind of like shots across the bow from the v-twin folks i also thought this was interesting because when i first glanced a photo of it and just looked at the front end it kind of was reminiscent to me of the lowrider st which i am completely obsessed with so i am kind of here for this bike i think this has loads of style it is definitely leaning way into like this west coast kind of fxr choppery vibe that's going on with the big high kind of like t-bars up in the top and the little screen um i wish it had more screen and i wish it had bags on it um basically i kind of wish it was a lowrider st but <laughs> it still is a very very cool bike i also was really surprised to hear about a couple of the little like thoughtful touches it isn't just you know new paint it isn't just as josh and i talk about it, it isn't just uh new graphics bold new graphics going on this actually does have a little bit of consideration into it including that upgraded suspension and i was totally shocked to see that it's got in that in that little bucket that you just showed a picture of ashley if you can go back to it i was totally shocked to see that that little bucket there that little four inch itty bitty guy that's a touch screen dash that's crazy i can't believe they've managed to jam that in there so anyway that's what's going on for the folks at indian motorcycle is it a sport is it a chief who knows, but it's an Indian sport chief. Josh, what do you think? So, I mean, so the the you see the classic Indian engine styling in this. You see this classic styling in this. And it's one of those things, so you see all of that, and then you see that dashboard, which, don't get me wrong, all of this is extremely well done. But do you want a new bike or do you want an old bike? Which one do you want? Um, it, yeah. it confuses me. So I, I get that. The other thing is, is the so with the rear Fox shocks, the my worry is is they talk about more lean angle but it raises that center of gravity up quite a bit which is difficult the other thing is is i did smile when you say 23 degrees of lean angle because as a supermoto guy we're i mean we're one-handed we're taking a drink <laughs> as we're doing stuff like that so yeah. i've i've i found it they're bragging about their lean angle but for a bike like this i tell you what it's good it's it, like I said, I don't, the, the classic with the modern stuff is weird to me. I know people are going to dig this bike though. Yeah. Yeah. I dig it. I, I am on the complete opposite side of that. I love classic looking bikes that have a little bit of more thoughtful touches to them. I am totally here for it. Um, and I do think this is an incredibly sharp bike. You pointed out your very first comment was the styling of it and how the engine is so front and center. Yeah. I do have to admit this new chief, which They've done, this is now like the second version of the Indian Chief since yep. their relaunch in 2011 or so. Um, this new style uh, from noted designer Ola Stengard, who's a, who's a friend of mine. Uh, Ola Stengard is in charge, of this, in charge of a lot of the design here. Uh, he really has taken it to heart to celebrate that engine and put it just yeah. front and center on display. No shrouds, nothing else around it. And I think that that makes this extra, extra cool. So that's anyway, right. that's what's going on for the folks at Indian Motorcycle. Josh, what do you got going on for your second story? So I talked about T7th Heaven, which you figure it's probably going to be a Tenere 700 comment, right? It is. So <laughs> we, we already have the Rally and the, what is the uh, other one? The World Raid Editions. So now there is the Extreme 
and Explorer editions, which to me, I actually, these are the two editions that I think Yamaha should have done first with this, to be honest with you. So with the Extreme Edition, it's going to be the first one here when we've got just that blue one on the screen. The first thing that I saw as soon as I saw this photo was that high fender, which for anyone that has ever ridden a middle weight or bigger adventure bike and has dealt with a low fender, you're like, ah, yes, get that thing up there. Now, there's still a piece here, but I'm pretty sure that's pr probably going to make it in the garbage can for most people, and <laughs> we still have a fender on it. Um, the front forks are KYBs, fully adjustable. They've got an additional 20 millimeters of travel over what the uh, factory forks do. There also is the Kashima coating on that. That is a hard anodizing process. It makes things very, very, very smooth to help avoid stiction. It also helps for longevity on seals. Um, there is also a five inch TFT display on this, which is a big upgrade from what we've had before. There are three different themes available for it. Um, they also added 20 more millimeters of rear travel and 20 more millimeters of travel for your butt. They made the seat 20 millimeters thicker on that. In addition, the last big thing that I saw was they had titanium foot pegs, and these things are big, meaty, and grabby. Do not hit your shins on them. They will remove most of the skin, which is exactly what yes. most of us want. The next version <laughs> that we have is the Explore version. Now, from the T7, this has 20 millimeters less travel, and this comes in the gray version that you see here, also comes in blue. But you can see it's got the original lower fender. It has a 33.9 inch seat height, which for the T7 is super low. Like I said, there's 20 millimeters less travel in both front and rear. They have increased the spring rates though, which that is an awesome thing that Yamaha's done. This one does come with pannier brackets and they realize that you may be throwing some stuff in the back of those. And they also realize that since it has shorter travel, you're gonna need a little bit more spring in order to keep you from bottoming this bad boy out. The other things with this, this does have that five inch TFT screen and it has a higher, taller windscreen that gives you 50% better coverage. To me, these two bikes are, at, I mean, these are the versions that Yamaha I mean, should have come out with in 2020. I am so glad to see these. The sad face that I am still making, besides the fact that neither one of these are in my garage, is they have not made <laughs> these available yet in the US. These are Euro uh, models so far. But to me, I think there's gonna be enough of a push for Yamaha to bring these over. There's not really anything different emissions-wise or anything like that. It's, it's suspension. It's the same thing that Husqvarna, KTM, a number of others are doing. So I think this bike has been enough of a hit that Yamaha will do it. Make sure that you scream at Yamaha online because we need to see both of these here for people like me that are going to go out and do dumb things and people like Jackie that would like a slightly lower seat height and they <laughs> keep to do rational human things on their bikes. <laughs> what, what, I mean, to me, this is a great decision from Yamaha. What do you think, Jackie? No? Well, as much as you dislike motorcycles that are like old meets new, I dislike motorcycles that call themselves extreme. It's just a personal thing for me. I, it immediately sets me off. I'm like, extreme what? Extreme who? What on earth are you talking about? Uh, anyway, uh, but but that's cool. Kudos to them. I, you know, the bike is selling well, clearly, because this yes. is now like the fourth version of this thing. Uh, the murdered <laughs> out guy, the second guy, I thought that was just very sexy, yeah. very mean, very nasty looking. Um, I would not quite need a cherry picker to ride it, just maybe like a nice like step ladder. I could I could handle that for sure. Uh, no, I but love the cheese. Tenere. I think the bike. I think I think the bikes are gorgeous. I think in this space it's at the top of the list of things i would probably yep. pick if i had to pick one um and you know it's the, they're doing the right thing they're doing the right thing it's a great bike i think it's super cool it's the right time right now and it's the right middleweight adventure bike so uh that's going to be a yes yes and a yes for me as far as talking about adventuring however josh i do want to leave today's program with just one last slide i wanted to throw up real quick and that is a reminder that this weekend out in las 
Vegas, the Mint 400 is underway. The Mint 400 is America's largest, best known, oldest off-road rally in the U.S. This is a fantastic event. This is motorcycles, cars, trucks, unlimited class, uh, quads. It's it's everything. Uh, vintage V-dubs, I saw they posted on their Instagram. So they even have a vintage bug class. So really, really neat racing. Make sure you go check out, follow along on their social. This is out in Las Vegas. This is the historical um, race that Hunter S. Thompson attended and wrote about himself. So just to give you a little bit of provenance about how important this race is. I think it's just a heck of a good time. This is the second year in a row this has creeped up on me. I completely forgot the date. It did book tickets to go out and go for it. So <laughs> you all have to live vicariously through me, my West Coast friends, and please go attend this race and, and report back and let us know how awesome it is because I am dying to go. Anywho, that's today's program, Josh. Woo, at 30 minutes. Yeah, this was a lots. double header. So lots going on out here in motorcycling. Thanks to each and every one of you for tuning in every single week. Make sure you hit that share button. Your buddies who are not going to want to miss what's going on out here in motorcycling and power sports. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.